Ron was a very generous husband. He would do anything that I asked him to do, go anywhere that I wanted to go. He was very loving. Two days before, my brother and I went fishing and had, as usual, a good time together. But then when I got the call, I mean, it was just, it was shocking to hear that something had happened to him. As I arrived at the crime scene, I would have to say I probably saw the most gruesome scene that I have encountered in my career. It was in his home. Uh, he was minding his own business. And ultimately, uh, the only thing that he did that led to his death was open the door to a stranger. There was no connection, which is probably what makes this the scariest possible crime. I did not know of anybody who did not like Ron. I don't think anybody would have harmed him. People just loved Ron. Ron was a very kind, generous man. He would give you the shirt off of his back. He was very religious. The church had been a lot to Ron. He was the pastor of it for many years. On February the 7th, I kissed him and told him I loved him and told him goodbye. I was going to take my mom out to her cousin's house and I was gone all day. He stayed at home and was going to study his Bible. It was Saturday. On February 7, 2015, it, it was just like any other day that we see in a, uh, typically in a February. Uh, it was pretty cold. Uh, it wasn't a lot of snow on the ground, uh, but it was, uh, you know, chilled. You know, it's what you would expect in our area for that, that climate. We was coming back, and I had told my mom that it was strange that I hadn't heard from Ron all day long. He always calls me two or three times a day when I'm out like that, and he didn't that day. I pulled up into the house. I did smell gas, and I went upstairs to, on the porch and went into the house. I went into the kitchen because I had a cake in my hand to put the cake down on the table. And I hollered for him and asked him what was going on because I had seen hair in the floor. And I went to the hall and my dog came out and she was shaking. And that's when I turned around and I seen Ron laying in the floor. I'm a one word. <laughs> I just got a hold of my... I was the party, it's like somebody's been in my house and there's stuff dirt everywhere. What's your name? My name is Rex Santa Brownie. I am his wife. Okay. Is he breathing? No, no. Okay, how, how, li okay listen to me. How old is he? He is 69 years old. Okay. Do you know what happened to him? No, no, I don't. What's his name? Uh, Ron, Ronald, Browning. <laughs> you think somebody's been in there fighting with me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've got help coming. They're coming as fast as they can, coming from downtown, okay? The initial responding officer, when he arrived, he entered the home. He immediately recognized that this was not uh, not an accident. It was not a medical call. Uh, so what he chose to do is he did what we would consider clearing the scene. Uh, he went room by room through the residence to make sure that there were no assailants still on scene. Uh, and what he noticed is uh, a copious amount of blood throughout the residence. 
he went to the basement of the home and discovered that gasoline had been poured around the basement area. Uh, at that point, he exited, secured the crime scene with crime scene tape, uh, and called for us to respond. I arrived at the scene at about 6 p.m. that afternoon. The victim's wife, Rexana, was noticeably distraught, uh, I would say almost in shock. When we entered the residence, we observed that the victim had suffered some extreme trauma, uh, particularly what we would consider to be blunt force trauma to his head and face. Uh, there was an extreme amount of blood in the living room areas. It appeared that there was quite a struggle that had occurred, and, and we noted that around this victim's head, there was a large amount of shards of glass and change and various items of that nature. We recognized that this scene was expansive. It was a lot of evidence that needed collected. We chose to contact the West Virginia State Police Crime Response Team. They have a lot of resources. The crime scene at Ronald Browning's house was probably one of the bloodiest crime scenes um, in Raleigh County history. Uh, the extreme violence that was used uh, left an absolutely chaotic scene um, and one that uh, I won't soon forget. Well, on February the 7th, I was home with my wife, and we received a phone call from Ronald's wife, and she said that something had happened at the house and that he had been murdered. And we couldn't understand how you can come out and say it just like that. But I guess she was in shock, too. And uh, that's when we decided that we was going to drive to his house. Well, when I talked to the police officer at the scene, I asked him what was going on, and he told me that Ron had been murdered. And it was just unbelievable. And they said that we need to leave the area, so we did. We stayed for just a few minutes, and then we went back home and didn't know anything. When we see a victim with that much severe trauma, that's typically what we would consider to be overkill typically somebody that's perpetuated by somebody that knows the victim. Overkill is when there's more done to kill a person than is necessary. So this is evidence of aggression, violence, hatred, typically things that are very interpersonal in nature. The other thing is it may be sadistic, where somebody really gets pleasure out of the torture and pain that they're inflicting on somebody else. But in all of these circumstances, far more is done to a person than is necessary to kill them. In any investigation, there's a component of victimology, trying to decide what type of victim you're, you're, you're working with here, uh, what ties they may have had, individuals they may have been associated with. Ronald Browning was an incredible person. He was a family man. He had um, a wife uh, and family that loved him very much. He was a local pastor of a church. Uh, he volunteered at a local hospital. Um, and he had a lot of people that loved him. One of the first steps that we take in investigation of this nature is a canvas of the area uh, in hopes that someone saw a vehicle, saw a person on the street. Uh, didn't glean a whole lot of information from that canvas at that point. At the commencement of an investigation, one of the things we look for is possible suspects and in order to obtain that list of possible suspects, we explore motive. Um, so this case was unique in that at this point in time, we didn't have a motive, we didn't have a rationale, and we didn't know if we needed to connect some dots or there was a connection that we didn't know about. The original FBI profilers used to say what plus why equals who in any type of crime such as this. And so when you don't understand why, trying to understand who did it was even more difficult. And in this case, when police had no understanding of the motive, and they had no idea why this crime was committed, it meant that anybody could be a suspect. 
there was some information that we were able to glean from the crime scene itself pretty early on. Uh, one of the first things is that we recognized that whoever had done this to Mr. Browning had clearly injured themselves in the process. Uh, and from the amount of blood that we found strewn throughout the residence, we could tell that they were injured pretty severely. Uh, so one of the things that we initiated early on was checking the hospitals to see if anybody had come in with these severe injuries that we would expect. Globally, 96% of all killers are male, so the police would be thinking that it's more likely to be a man who has inflicted this level of violence because this is really very brutal. But the crime scene is chaotic and the manner of death is incredibly chaotic as well. It's looking really disorganized and that is a clue to who might be responsible. They might be chaotic and they might be disorganized themselves. Hundreds of photographs were taken at the scene. It was such an extensive scene that uh, the processing took uh, hour upon hour. Uh, I would say in the range of probably 12 hours total, just, just processing the scene and taking photographs. In this case, the photos gave a glimpse of the level of violence and the level of um, evil uh, that was present in Ronald Browning's house that night. My brother was the kind of guy that <laughs> didn't bother anybody. <laughs> and this should never happen to him. He'd do anything for anybody in the world. And for him to be killed this way, yeah. just unbelievable. We are at Coolbridge Community Church. This is where Ron was pastor. And this is also where we got married on April the 19th. 2014. This is a picture of our wedding cake, which was made by my niece that we're cutting. Me walking down the aisle with my brothers, which gave me away. We were all in pink and white. This is where me and Ron just had got married and we're holding hands. He had married Rexana, which was a good marriage for both of them. They both needed somebody in her life at the time, and they had a good marriage. She went to church with him all the time and was very devoted as far as being with him. It was nice to reconnect with Ron later in life. He was a joy to be around. He was my best friend. I never expected to find love like we had. This is probably the best uh, photograph to show what I saw when I arrived. Uh, the scene had been secured with this yellow crime scene tape. Uh, Rexana Browning's car was in the driveway. And at that time, his wife, Rexana, was seated in this vehicle, the rear seat of this vehicle, uh, awaiting the detective's arrival. Uh, and this would be the door that we believe the suspect exited from the basement door. At about 8.45 that evening, uh, we had the opportunity to speak with the victim's wife, Rexana. You know, in a general sense, everybody was a suspect because we were unable to determine anybody that would logically do this to this 69-year-old man. Uh, and due to the extent of the assault, we certainly felt that it was somebody connected to him or a family member, you know, right off the bat is something that we would expect. So she was, I would say, a person of interest is how we would describe her. The fact that she was gone during the day, the fact that she was rather emotionless uh, in that shocked state at that point in time was a little bit suspect. Uh, we certainly didn't think that she was physically capable of doing what, what was done to Mr. Browning, uh, but we wanted to make sure that nothing else 
that play a role. When police first meet with Roxana, the wife of the victim, there are a lot of reasons why they thought she was very unlikely to have done this due to her size, stature. But at the same time, given that she was in his inner circle and the statistics show people that are closest to the victim are most likely to have committed the crime, police felt like they really can't eliminate her as a suspect until they have hard evidence to do so. What we learned about their relationship was that uh, Mr. Browning and Ms. Browning had been uh, married for about nine months, had known each other for 14 years prior to that, uh, knew each other through the hospital, I believe, and really there was no indication that they had ever had any sort of conflict or any kind of violence or anything of that nature that would make us suspicious. Ms. Browning did advise that she had an alibi. Uh, we were able to verify that through other people who had attended that same family reunion. Uh, she was cleared as a suspect quite early in this investigation. In relation to the crime scene itself, we wanted to find out if there was anything that Ms. Browning had noticed that stood out. I did not notice anything wrong right away. It was once I got into the house and into the kitchen that I had noticed that the milk jug and the hair in the floor, which I picked up, and I laid it on his recliner chair. The house was tore up. There was blood everywhere in the house. Once I started noticing the curtains in the living room was tore off of the wall. There was blood on the curtains in the bathroom. There was blood in the sink in the bathroom. There was uh, blood in the toilet in the bathroom. The uh, attic ladder was pulled down and a white cabinet had been knocked over. Throughout our conversation with Ms. Browning, obviously one of the things that we wanted to determine is could she think of anyone that would do this kind of violence to her husband? I did not know of anybody who did not like Ron. He was very happy. People just loved Ron. I don't think anybody would have would have harm, harmed him. We noticed the, the braided hair pieces pretty quickly on, uh, and that was for a number of reasons, but primarily because they were so commingled with the victim's blood. They were literally underneath his body. There were the hair braided hair pieces were there. Uh, so we knew that was significant. As the crime scene team processed the, the scene, they indicated that it appeared the murder weapon in this case was going to be a large glass jar full of change, uh, just based on the scene itself. It appeared that this person that did this crime had entered the attic, they had entered the basement, they had gone through every drawer that we could find, they had been at the kitchen sink, they had used the shower, they had been in all the restrooms. Uh, it, this person spent a good deal of time there, and that was interesting to us as well. And they indicated that they had located things such as a bloody gas can in the basement, and it appeared that a person had spread gasoline around the residence in, in an attempt to set it ablaze. Based upon the evidence found at the scene, police were able to determine that this was a very frenzied, haphazard, and spontaneous scene. The fact that the murder weapon used to kill Browning was all taken from this house. There were all objects that were available, showed there was no premeditation. The person that was the killer did not bring a weapon with them. It just suggests that there was something a little more spontaneous that went on. But at the same time, there was a lot of passion and anger involved in it. You know, at some point in an investigation, there comes a time when you almost have to get together and have a little brainstorm session. We mentioned that there were braided hair pieces discovered amongst this, this violent attack, uh, and bus underneath the victim's body, uh, a uniformed patrol officer advised us that he had just recently taken a missing persons report. A worried mother had, had called the police, had advised them uh, that her adult daughter was in the process of having her hair braided. Uh, the mother had left the room for a short period of time. When she returned, the, the daughter was gone. She wandered from the room, 
uh, left her phone in the room and was unable to be contacted by anybody after that point. Uh, one of the other things that we discovered during this uh, kind of get putting our minds together at the office, uh, some of the other officers had overheard our conversation and that we suspected the person to be very injured, the suspect in this case. Uh, an officer approached me and told me that he had been aware that a female, a 19-year-old female, had been arrested uh, in a neighboring jurisdiction, Mabscott, West Virginia. Uh, as we looked into the investigation of the Mabscott Police Department, we determined that uh, the suspect had actually forced herself into two other homes. Uh, in the first one, she approached a, a very elderly man, and she subsequently went into another residence of a family uh, who was able to uh, basically dissuade her long enough that they could contact law enforcement. 911, where is your emergency? Hello? Hey! Hey! Get the out of here right now. 911. You don't push my mom down. Brian, Brian, calm down. Calm down. Now, I'm what? Get out of my house and knock my mom down. Now. This is, I'm not trying to disrespect you. I don't care. Now. It's my house. Now. I'll give you 10 seconds. Get the out of my house. Y'all get out of the goddamn what? way. Jacob, just like. Four. He's pointing to me at four and one. Hey. What is this four and one? Give me the keys to the car. Give me the keys to the car. No, ma'am. Give me the keys to the car. That's my dead mom. I've got to open the disturbance. Yes, there is a black lady in the house. When we initially heard the description of the individual that Mapscott Police had arrested, uh, to be honest, we were quite skeptical that that could be our suspect just because it's not what you would normally expect. A 19-year-old female uh, would not have matched the suspect that we would intend, expect to see in such a violent incident as what we, what we encountered. He was gotten in the house and won't leave, but she's going back and forth, very psychotic. Okay, and you don't know who this black woman is? No, no idea. They don't know. We've never seen her. Y'all got to hurry and get here and get her. She's going to hurt somebody. We can't get her out of the house. At the time of her arrest, she had severe, very severe injuries to her hands, uh, particularly lacerations and cuts, which is exactly what we expected our suspect to have. As soon as we determined that Mab Scott had arrested that female and her physical description matched the hairstyle that we were looking for, uh, we traveled to the hospital and made contact with her there, and that's when we discovered her name was Camille Brown. One of the key pieces of evidence from the crime scene uh, was the braids that was intermingled uh, in Ron Browning's blood. Um, that's specifically significant because Camille Brown was in the process of getting her hair braided when she went missing earlier in the day. I observed Camille sitting on a gurney inside the hospital, just acting erratic. Uh, I was shocked to see a 19-year-old girl in that condition, but she was basically incoherent. She wasn't making a lot of sense. Uh, we did not attempt to really talk to her about our, our incident at that time. At first, Camille Brown uh, was being treated at Raleigh General Hospital. Ultimately, she was so combative uh, and uh, violent at Raleigh General, they refused to treat her. And these are some photographs from the hospital. Uh, we did have a significant struggle with her at the hospital uh, in attempts to take her into custody. Uh, she fought very violently in that parking area. And it was a unique situation in that her family arrived at the hospital. Uh, so this was the first time they had seen her since they had filed a missing persons report. Uh, which led to a very emotional, emotionally charged situation. Uh, as we were trying to restrain her, they were trying to, to retrieve her, and uh, it was a bad situation all the way around. Ultimately, the Beckley City Police Department was left with no choice but to take her to Beckley Appalachian Regional Hospital, where she was treated 
uh, but she had to be physically restrained in order to do so. And this is a hospital that specializes in uh, restraining violent individuals or uh, mentally unstable individuals. Uh, and they had to use sedatives and physical restraints, and it took five or six officers just to hold her down long enough to get her injuries treated. The jacket that Camille Brown was wearing when she was arrested actually belonged to Ronald Browning. The jacket was his uh, chaplain jacket from Raleigh General Hospital uh, that belonged to him. Ultimately, that was a key piece of evidence, the fact that she was wearing it um, not very long in time after the commission of the crime. A lot of times when there's a murder that they do suspect that it was somebody in the family. We were told that they had already talked to Rexon and that uh, she hadn't got there till after he was murdered. But they had apprehended a young lady in the neighborhood who had been to different houses and that they had apprehended her and talked to her. And as soon as she got in the car, she made the comment she had killed this old gray-headed white man. We were unable to establish a motive because we knew that Miss Browning, the victim's wife, uh, was unaware of Camille Brown. There was no connection there. Uh, and we didn't know what her role could have been at that point. We began to canvas the area for security cameras. Uh, we knew that Miss Brown lived near in the area. Uh, we knew the, the likely way she would travel to the victim's residence. And we secured some video footage that showed Miss Brown jogging down the street prior to the homicide. In the process of, of canvassing the area, we realized that this trail existed. And in that process is when we discovered droplets of blood. And we believe that this is the trail that the suspect took after she committed the homicide. Uh, we believe she walked this trail to Mapscott where she was later arrested. The police told me that a girl had been into the house and had been into several houses in the neighborhood just walked in and terrorized people. And I couldn't believe that somebody had went in the house and did what they'd done. In this particular case, I feel like there was enough physical evidence to, to arrest her, but we certainly didn't want to leave it at that. So what we chose to do is to attempt to interview Miss Brown so that we could find out more information and see if she may confess to this. She then told investigators that she even kicked the man in the chest area because he just wasn't dying. Uh, after the commission of the crime, she told investigators that she rummaged through the house, even looking at mail uh, and several other uh, items that were scattered about the home. She then later told uh, the police that she ultimately spread gasoline through the basement area 
because the plan or her plan was to set the house on fire to try to uh, hide evidence of the commission of the crime. I figured if I was going to get caught, mm -hmm. burn the house up. Oh, OK. Why, why didn't you, uh, why didn't you like the, the gasoline? Because I can't get back upstairs for the time matches. One of the things that we noted pretty early on is that there was no connection between Camille Brown and Ron Browning. Uh, we found that to be kind of surprising, to be honest, because there was so much violence here that we expected our suspect to have a connection to the victim. Uh, in this instance, that wasn't the case. In my experience, stranger murders, specifically in Southern West Virginia, are a statistical improbability. You are far more likely to be killed by someone you know and typically the statistics would indicate that those individuals are likely male. This is the least likely suspect. First of all, of course, she is a woman, so she's in that 4% of women who kill, and she's only a young woman. There's no connection between Camille Brown and Pastor Ron. Of course, there was a wealth of forensic evidence that they could rely on to prove that she was the person responsible. But I think that the, the whys and the wherefores of it, that was all to do with her behavior, and her behavior was very, very strange. The suspect in this case is quite a paradox. Uh, is a 19-year-old girl. She has an impeccable history as far as the community goes. Uh, she had not been in any trouble, had not had any previous arrests. But there again, she's probably committed one of the most gruesome, heinous crimes that this city has ever seen. This girl had knocked on the door and asked for a drink of water. And that uh, when he opened the door, evidently she had more in mind than getting a drink of water, that she had killed him. The funeral happened in Beckley. There were so many people that the church couldn't even begin to hold the amount of people that showed up. There was a lot of things said about Ron, what a great guy he was, and how giving he was, what a good preacher he was. It was hard being at my brother's funeral. We was always so close. <laughs> and it was like a big part of me was lost <laughs> because he was so important to me. After my brother had been killed, we had heard from the news and on TV that this was a 19-year-old girl that was a good girl, went to college. She had lived with her mom and dad. And it was like hearing about her and knowing what happened just didn't add up. There were some things that were troubling about Camille's uh, lifestyle that we discovered as we began the prosecution process. Uh, one of the things that we discovered is that she had kind of been leading a double life. Uh, and what I mean by that is that she had gone away to school, to, to West Virginia University. Uh, unbeknownst to her family, she had actually dropped out of school shortly after arriving, uh, began to work in a, uh, a gentleman's club in that area. Uh, was not attending classes, was not uh, going to school in any fashion. All she was doing is the family was continuing to send her money, and as a, instead of it going to the school, it was going to her personal life, and she was uh, living a, a different life than she was suggesting. Well, the kind of character she showed was kind of what she proved when she'd done what she'd done to my brother. She showed that she didn't have any morals, that it didn't matter to her as long as it was all about her. And that's what it turned out to be. 
all about her. Obviously, there was some, some suspicion uh, that Miss Brown had been involved in some sort of drug activity just by her very erratic behavior. Uh, we had nothing to support that at that time, but through our conversation with Miss Brown, she indicated that the only illicit substances that she was involved in during that period of time uh, was marijuana. She stated that she had smoked a marijuana uh, cigarette approximately 30-some uh, hours prior to this incident, and that uh, that was the only drug activity she had been involved in in that period. In the early days of this case, uh, I felt the case would be uh, primed for trial in that we had a statement from the defendant indicating that she had committed the crime. We had a litany of items of physical evidence that pointed to her committing the crime. And I felt that this was um, going to be uh, pretty much sell through without a problem. Due to the diagnostic testing that was done uh, by mental health experts, uh, there was conflicting ideas. We knew there would be an uphill battle to uh, counteract these opinions of, of some of the doctors. There was uh, two forensic uh, psychological evaluations done of Ms. Brown and at the very least, this was going to present a problem with uh, a trial verdict on first degree murder. You know, we could not get a competing expert to go against what the defense experts were saying. So ultimately, the reason a plea was offered to begin with is because they had expert witnesses that were going to put forth a mitigation defense for the defendant. A mitigation defense is essentially where somebody admits to having committed a crime, in this case murder, but says that there were some mitigating reasons for why it occurred. This could be things like self-defense or that there was some mind-altering reason for why they had done it. Essentially that they did not have the ability to either form intent to commit the crime the way a otherwise well-adjusted person would have or that they didn't know the difference between right and wrong for a variety of reasons, typically mental disorders or other issues in their life. Brown's case didn't go to trial. Um, she pled guilty to two counts of burglary and second degree murder in May of 2016. Camille Brown was in a state of agitation, paranoia, and she was incredibly violent. She is clearly somebody who was in an extremely disturbed and disturbing, dangerous state. And yes, that can happen with psychosis. It's not common, but it can happen. And it's incredibly frightening, isn't it, to think that somebody can go from literally zero to 100 in a very short space of time. Because if you had met her, maybe even just a day or two days before she killed Pastor Ron, you would think, what a lovely girl. There's nothing particularly unusual about her. People don't understand how quickly people can switch when they've been taking substances, if they have psychosis. It can be, on rare occasions, incredibly rapid and incredibly, incredibly dramatic. And that was the case here. The sentencing was a pretty emotional time for everybody. Uh, the, the family was, both families were there, the family of the victim, the family of uh, Camille. Uh, they were all present and they were both highly emotionally charged. Um, Camille's family did not want to see her go away for any amount of time. Uh, and Mr. Browning's family wanted to see what they would feel would be just, which would be a life sentence. It was hard to sit there and watch her put on a show that she put on, knowing that she'd kill my brother. So she acted like nothing was wrong. It was all about her. 
She never turned at any time and looked at us. She spoke straight to the court. She didn't look at her mom and dad. She didn't look at us. It was all like she rehearsed what she was going to say and how she was going to say it. At sentencing in this matter, uh, Rexana Browning spoke, which was Ronald Browning's wife. Also, his brother Ralph spoke. Um, and it was very emotional, very raw in the courtroom. And you could just tell how much they loved uh, Ronald Browning. I was asked to give a statement. And I told him, in my opinion, that this girl should never be let out of jail. To know somebody that was as good as he was, that had to die like that. It was just unreal. I mean, for somebody to, to treat you like that. And she didn't know him from anybody. But he never harmed anybody, ever. And to have to die like that was unreal. In the end, Camille was uh, agreed to a 40-year sentence uh, to first-degree homicide and also to two counts of burglary, which would have been one to five sentences each. Uh, the judge chose to reduce that sentence on his own. Uh, he reduced the homicide sentence to a 30-year sentence. My hopes in obtaining justice uh, for Ronald Browning's family uh, would have been life in prison. I believe that, you know, examining this case some five years after it was pled and some seven years after it happened, uh, the sentiment is that uh, within the criminal justice system, the punishment was insufficient for the crime that was committed. I believe the victim's family feels that way. I believe certain members of law enforcement feel that way. Honestly, in this particular case, we're, I don't think we'll ever know why Camille Brown killed Mr. Browning. Uh, it's unfortunate and it's particularly frustrating for an investigator because uh, we typically want to get the answers. We want to know why something happened. But at the end of the day, I don't think we're ever going to know why. This was a complete senseless loss of life. Ronald Browning was a pastor, a volunteer, a husband, a brother, and his life was taken without motive or rationale. Ronald Browning's family has to live with unanswered questions for the rest of their lives. Um, I think that's probably the saddest part of this entire uh, chronicle for me. Camille Brown is an animal. She is cold, ruthless, my life changed February the 7th, 2015. Ron would have, Ron would have probably forget, forgave her. He was just that type of person, but I don't. The time I spent with Ron was too short. I think that we would have accomplished a lot more than what we did if he was still alive. Well, I'd just like to say that I honor my brother. And I would like to be with him again. And I will. <laughs> we'll be in heaven together. I'm 75 years old. So I don't live forever. And I'll see you again. I just want everybody to know what kind of man he was. He loved the Lord. He'd do anything for anybody. I go to his gravesite to remember Ron. 
I remember Ron as being happy, him singing in church with me. He was just a very happy person. <laughs>